and rounds. Before I introduce our speaker, I have some housekeeping announcements. This CME activity is sponsored by the Hawaii Consortium for CME, a joint venture between the Hawaii Medical Association and the John A. Burns School of Medicine, University of Hawaii. At this time, please enter the name and credentials of everyone viewing Grand Rounds for CME attendance purposes. As a reminder, evaluations are required for CMEs. You can find the evaluations by following the link in the chat or at any time on our website or through our email advertisement. Your comments are very important to the planning committee and will be used to plan future programs. As you know, all sponsors of CME are required to execute a conflict of interest policy. Dr. Corey Liao has received research grants from the NIH, NIA, TD3, Athera, Takeda, UCB, Novo Nordisk, Ipsen, Avenir, Ra Pharma, Sanofi, Novartis, V Praxis, Anovis, Merck, Neuroderm, Cerevel, Acadia, and Bioge. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Liao is an NIH-trained research neurologist and director of the Memory Disorders Center. He's principal investigator of the Alzheimer's Research Unit at Hawaii Pacific Neuroscience. The Memory Disorders Center has served over 2,500 patients. The Alzheimer's Research Unit is currently conducting clinical trials in healthy volunteers to preclinical, mild cognitive impairment, and mild Alzheimer's disease patients. This includes phase zero, first in human translational research, and phase one overnight PK studies. Dr. Liao completed research fellowship at NINDS in the NIH at, in Bethesda, Maryland, after finishing neurology training at the University of Utah. He spends the majority of his time in research and has served as principal investigator for over 140 phase zero to four clinical trials sponsored by the NIH, CDC, and industry over the past 25 years. He has published over 50 peer-reviewed publications. Dr. Liao is a clinical professor of medicine and graduate faculty in clinical and translational research at the University of Hawaii, John A. Burns School of Medicine. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Liao. Good afternoon, and thank you, Dr. Masaki, for such an introduction. And it's always such a pleasure to, um, uh, to be back. And uh, as an investigator um, who works with uh, other organizations on the mainland, uh, as I was saying to Dr. Masaki earlier, it's such a, it's such a joy uh, when I talk with other investigators from uh, the mainland. Uh, everybody knows about the wonderful work that Dr. Masaki uh, and her colleagues and investigators are doing here at the Honolulu Star Aging. So um, uh, thank you again, Dr. Masaki, for uh, having me uh, talk at your grand rounds. Uh, today is my pleasure to present to you um, the title of New Era of Alzheimer's Dementia Treatment, Eduham, uh, and Other Emerging Treatments. So I want to start with a slide. Uh, this is, uh, as you can see, um, everybody knows about this slide, the blind man and the elephant. Um, and like, Dr. Liao? Yes. I'm so sorry, we don't see your slides yet. Oh, okay. Uh, let me see. Oh, my goodness. Let me just make sure that this. Hang on, I'm getting some help here. Uh, Share screen, perhaps screen two. screen two. Hang on a second. How about now? Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. I apologize for that. So um, everybody knows about the blind man and the elephant. Uh, so here's the blind man, uh, and he stresses the importance of perspective. The person at the top who's feeling the elephant's ear thinks that the elephant is like a fan. Obviously, the person over here who is feeling the tusk of the elephant says that elephant is a spear, 
And of course, the person who is, has the elephant's trunk thinks that, no, 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 elephant is a snake. And the person right by the elephant's leg says that elephant is a three. And of course, the person on the elephant's abdomen say it's a wall and it's a rope. So uh, I'm going to start and actually end with this slide too, uh, keeping in mind the importance of perspective. So again, thank you, Dr. Masaki. And I did want to disclose that I do receive funding from uh, the make of Aduham, uh, including Biogen and uh, many others. The objective of the talk is to uh, talk about the pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease uh, and aducanumab and talk about other mechanistic pathways and treatments. And also at the end, I'm really excited to share with you a small survey that our medical students did uh, with our team here, uh, including the help of Dr. Borman, uh, to poll our Hawaii Alzheimer's patients and caretaker about their, uh, whether they, are, they, they, they heard about Eduham and uh, what are the feelings about Eduham. So we're gonna share that at the end. So what is Eduham and or Aducanumab? Uh, how does it work? So aducanumab uh, works based, uh, is really based on the theory of the amyloid cascade hypothesis. Uh, everybody uh, heard about the amyloid cascade hypothesis, which has really, for the last 20 years, driven the therapeutic developments uh, of many, many drugs. Uh, so it's based on the fact that three ways we can stop Alzheimer's by decreasing the production, uh, either at the level. Uh, there are many drugs, the beta secretase drug, or the gamma secretase drug works on the transmembrane uh, protein and uh, or inhibits the aggregation of the beta amyloid, which is our bad boy here, uh, whether it's soluble monomer or the soluble oligomers and the fibers. Uh, so, and or increases the clearance of the uh, amyloid. So those are the three bases of the uh, amyloid cascade hypothesis. So aducanumab is a human, humanized monoclonal antibody. It binds to both the soluble and the insoluble aggregated beta amyloid. I'm gonna share with you the data from the phase three study, the eMERGE and the ENGAGE study. Um, the eMERGE studies is basically uh, consists of sites in North America and Europe, while the ENGAGE is worldwide, includes countries in Australia, Japan, and uh, South Korea. So the study, uh, the two studies are 18 months in length, the randomized double-blind placebo-controlled phase three studies. Uh, it involved more than 3,000 patients at almost 350 sites in 20 countries. The patient that they studied are MCI patients and mild Alzheimer's dementia patients. Inclusion criteria includes MMSC 24 to 30 and includes three, two dosing regimen high dose and low dose and placebo. So it's a one-to-one -one randomization, either the placebo, low dose or high dose. And the primary endpoint that they measured is CDR-SB, which I'll explain a little bit later. And there are other secondary endpoints. So what kind of patients did the two phase three studies uh, tested? The mean age of the patient are about 70 years old in both the eMERGE and the ENGAGE study, 53% uh, female, and about nine, eight to 10% Asian population, which is important for our Hawaii population. And about 50% of the patients actually are on other Alzheimer's medication, whether they're Donapazil, Anamanda, or something else. So they can be on other medications. About 60 to 70% of patients are carriers, uh, of at least one set of uh, E4. And majority of patients, about 80% of patients are MCI patients with about 20% in the mild Alzheimer's dementia. So what are the results? So I have what they, the primary endpoint is measuring the uh, clinical dementia rating for the sum of boxes score SB. So what are they? They are kind of like this, what I have here. Uh, these are the boxes. These are the tests that our study coordinators do uh, almost uh, every week here at the uh, Alzheimer's Research Unit. 
So they consist of 18 point skill. It measures cognition, memory, orientation, judgment, and problem solving, and function community affairs, and also home and hobbies, personal care. Um, what did they find? Uh, in the patients, so the green are the low dose, while the blue are the high dose. In the patients on the high dose, as you can imagine, there seems to be a 22% uh, reduction, uh, in, excuse me, 22% improvement in the CDR SB score as compared to uh, placebo uh, with a low dose about 15%. Uh, secondary endpoints include MSSE, ADAS-COP13, which is also another common test that we use here, uh, ADCS, ADL, activities of daily living. Tertiary endpoint includes uh, NPI, neuropsychiatric inventory, which measures agitation, behavior, and there seems to be some uh, effect on that as well. Um, what other things did they measure? They also measured the uh, PET amyloid load. Uh, so all the patients that went through the studies, the 78, remember it's a 78 week studies, had uh, PET imaging uh, looked at. And, uh, and again, the patients on high dose, which is a blue line, had about 64% uh, reduction change from the baseline of the uh, amyloid load. Uh, this is measuring the amyloid load in the brain as compared to the low, uh, patient on low dose had about 40% reduction. So to summarize the results, uh, Educanimat uh, phase three emerge and engaged studies uh, appears that high dose uh, did have a reduction in clinical decline at least across five clinical endpoints. Uh, the main one being CDR, uh, some of boxes. And the effects on the amyloid PET is uh, really what drove the uh, FDA approval, uh, about 64% reduction in the biomarker. Unfortunately, Engage uh, did not meet its primary endpoint, which is the uh, CDR, some of boxes. Now, there is a lot of debate about uh, the discordant results between the eMERGE and the Engage. Uh, which has been extensively investigated. Uh, one possible explanation is possibly that the patient uh, on the ENGAGE uh, were uh, on lower dose. The patients that were on 10 milligrams per kilogram uh, higher dose did have clinical efficacy consistent much. So the three doses are three milligrams, six milligrams, and 10 milligrams. Um, and also, the other explanation would be uh, the distribution of patient. Perhaps the patients in the engaged group were rapid progressors. Uh, perhaps they're more, uh, more advanced Alzheimer's that were recruited. So what are the side effects? Everybody wants to know uh, as we're doing clinical trials, what are we looking at and what should we be looking for in our patients? So, um, the main thing to look for is ARIA, A-R-I-A, which stands for Amyloid Related Imaging Abnormalities. Uh, what are ARIA? ARIA refers to radiographic abnormalities observed with anti-amyloid antibodies with aducanumab uh, or other uh, monoclonal antibodies as well. Uh, we don't really know why it happened. Perhaps it could be from increased cerebral vascular permeability because of the antibody binding uh, to the uh, deposited uh, beta amyloid. There are two different types of area to look for, area E for edema and area H for hemorrhage. So area E, just like you see here on the diagram, these are the white, uh, uh, hyper-intense white signals uh, on the MRI. You can see that just like any other uh, cerebral edema, you see that and area H, as you can see in a parietal lobe here, uh, uh, brain microhemorrhages. So what should we really be looking for in the patients? Is area symptomatic? Uh, well, the most common symptoms, uh, just like any cerebral edema, uh, we should be looking for headaches, confusion, dizziness, and nausea. Those are the four most common symptoms. Uh, fortunately, luckily, area, uh, most of them are asymptomatic. Uh, about 74% of patients are really didn't complain of anything uh, or is symptomatic. 
Uh, that's fortunate. And the other thing about urea is that uh, it is also only seen mostly in the patients on so a 10 milligrams group, or the, uh, the high dose 10 milligram group. Uh, it is less common in a three or the six milligrams group. Perhaps um, that it probably explained why the indication of uh, Ipipenimat is to get an MRI prior to the seven dose and prior to the 12 dose. So the patients that had urea uh, edema, uh, did it go away? Uh, was, it, was it permanent? Uh, again, uh, for the 362 cases of urea edema noted on the MRI, uh, again, 98% uh, 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 of them resolved, they were reversible. About 70% of them resolved within 12 weeks. So what is really the safety profile of the adverse events of aducanumab? Uh, the safety profile of aducanumab is well characterized, at least in these clinical trials, in an emerge and engaged trial. Um, urea edema is the most common side effects. Remember that they usually manifest as headache, dizziness, confusion, uh, and they are transient. Majority are reversible, and thankfully, majority are also asymptomatic. Uh, and they can be mitigated routine MRI and dosing manage, uh, management. Most of them occurs around 10 milligrams per kilograms. Uh, the patients that were on the maximum dose 10 milligrams per kilogram. So around 300 BC, uh, there's a Greek philosopher, Aristotle. He thought that earth is the center of the universe. Well, we all know that that's, that's not true, but how on earth did, uh, how on earth did he ever thought that earth is the center of the universe? Well, because Aristotle thought that at any point on the earth, at any time of the day, if you look at the sun, they're about equidistance. Uh, they look like they're about the same distance from, um, uh, uh, from where you are. So it must be, the earth must be the center of the universe. So I borrowed this diagram from uh, Rico uh, Richard Rally, which is an invest, uh, investigator at University of Milan, uh, from an article he published, The Amyloid Cascade Hypothesis in Alzheimer's Disease. Is it time to change our mind? Published in 2017. He was just making fun at the people who thinks that amyloid cascade, everything else, whether it's neuroinflammation, synaptic loss, oxidative stress, vascular changes, neuronal death, loss of connectivity, the tau theory has to revolve around uh, amyloid. Uh, so he called that the amyloidocentric theory of Alzheimer's disease. I'm kind of half joking, but half serious too. Well, what other theories is there really out there that could potentially well, one of the, one of the study that we are actually um, engaging in is looking at metabolism. Uh, is Alzheimer's a, a problem of the brain metabolism, metabolism issue? So we have the amyloid theory, the tau theory, the inflammation theory, the vascular changes theory. The metabolism seems to kind of interrelate it to all of these multiple other ideologies. So it seems reasonable enough to at least consider that. So we are working with a company called Type T3D on a study called the Pioneer Study. It's an NIH funded study. And uh, T3D, as you can guess, uh, it's called Type 3 Diabetes. Um, and the company, I guess they are so confident that this is the theory, they actually named the company Type 3 Diabetes, saying that Alzheimer's is a Type 3 diabetes of the brain. The tenet is that uh, there is abnormal brain metabolism uh, that results in Alzheimer's. Uh, what is the abnormal metabolism? It is the glucose metabolism and the lipid metabolism. So if you look at the PET imaging of Alzheimer's patient, you can see that glucose metabolism is, uh, this is FDG glucose PET scan of MCI and Alzheimer's patient. Uh, glucose metabolism is signified by the rate. Areas are significantly decreased, especially in the parietal and temporal lobes. And 
and also uh, lipid metabolism, uh, adipose inclusion has actually, uh, triglyceride has been described as early as 1906. And both of those are created by insulin uh, resistance um, related to insulin-like growth factor. So what is really the link between Alzheimer's and glucose metabolism? Well, we know that the diabetics take, for example, have twofold increased risk of getting Alzheimer's. About 70% of diabetics ultimately develop Alzheimer's and 37% of Alzheimer's patients are diabetic versus about 10% general population. And similar, there are similarities between the Alzheimer's and type two diabetes patient. The common theme again is insulin resistance. So just like the Alzheimer's patient, diabetic patients have cognitive decline. Uh, they have amyloid aggregation, deposition, they have inflammation. And one thing, uh, interesting thing is uh, clinical symptoms of Alzheimer's do not occur without decreasing brain glucose metabolism. And elevated blood sugar is in associated with memory problems and lower brain and volume or atrophy of the brain. So what are we studying in this um, study here uh, in the P3D 959? It's a dual PPAR agonist. Uh, PPAR stands for a peroxisome pr proliferator activated receptor. There's two types. The primary target is delta and the secondary target is gamma. The delta uh, target is involved, is a regulator of energy expenditure and the gamma is energy storage. Um, both the regulators both works on both glucose and lipid metabolism. It is Luckily, the PPAR uh, receptors are found throughout the brain. This is an oral once a day dosing uh, capsule. And fortunately, it accesses the brain. It penetrates the blood brain barrier well. So we're very pleased to bring this study to Hawaii, uh, the T3D Pioneer study, NIH funded by the NIH phase two study uh, patients will be on the study for six months. Who are we looking for? We're looking for mild to moderately Alzheimer's dementia patient, according to NIA uh, Alzheimer's Associate Criteria, MMSC 14 to 26. So what about inflammation? What about oxidative stress and vascular dysfunction? Do, do they play a role? Well, um, well, I want to share this article, this diagram that I uh, borrowed from uh, this article, Getting to the Heart of Alzheimer's Disease, um, published uh, in 2019 in the Circulation Research in a Vascular Journal. We know that atherosclerosis, inflammation, and uh, cardiovascular risk factors like hypertension or diabetes can decrease cerebral blood flow. And these are the white matter small vessel disease that we see on the MRI. Uh, sort of kind of like a soft findings that we see often in patients, especially with vascular dementia. But we're talking about Alzheimer's here. And also we know that decreased blood flow can also disrupt the blood brain barrier and leading to neurovascular unit breakdown. Also, we know that less, uh, the brain depends so much, consumes so much, so dependent on oxygen having less blood flow to it uh, causes significant oxidative stress. And that uh, could uh, result in deposits and all this potentially points to Alzheimer's disease. I'd like to talk to you about uh, another compound that we're studying here uh, in Hawaii uh, at the Memory Disorder Center and Alzheimer's Research Unit, CY6463. So what is C46463? C46463 is a positive allosteric modulator. Uh, it amplifies endogenous nitrous oxide signaling. Uh, we know that um, uh, nitrous oxide and uh, soluble guanine cyclis is fundamental to CNS signaling pathway. Uh, it regulates neuronal function, neural inflammation, and blood flow. Pathway is actually broadly expressed. Uh, in neurons, glial cells, and uh, in blood vessels. 
So by binding, uh, amplifying the endogenous nitrous oxide signaling, uh, we hope to uh, affect downstream targets like neuron neuronal function, inflammation, uh, bioenergetics, and vascular function. So the CY6463 uh, completed a translational study uh, early on uh, in 24 elderly subjects, half to um, IP or investigation product, half to placebo washout uh, 15 days. Um, to assess the safety PK. Uh, and what did they look at? Uh, they looked at uh, cerebral blood flow. They noted uh, increased cerebral blood flow. These are measured by MRI, uh, ASL, uh, arterial spin labeling studies uh, that we actually have to install, you know, MRI machine in order to measure this. Uh, they also look at cellular bioenergetics, bio uh, which is really just a brain metabolism. Uh, we measure that by MRI spectroscopy on the brain. Uh, we measure neuroinflammations, uh, inflammatory markers, cytokines, and adhesion molecules. And also, last but not least, we measure neuronal function. This is more of a network a connectivity, uh, which we can actually measure them with quantitative EEG, which I would uh, talk to you a little bit uh, more in a bit. So consider that um, uh, this product targets vascular uh, uh, CY6463 targets uh, uh, predominantly uh, uh, has a profound effects on vascular, what, what population would really benefit? What kind of uh, uh, Alzheimer's patients, the MCI, mild or moderate, or one of the target population that thought, they thought about is Alzheimer's patients with vascular pathology. All of us know that uh, many, many times when we look at those MRI of our patients, they're not always clean. They always have those small vessel, white matter disease, and it's, ah, it's probably a mix. You know, my patients had hypertension, diabetes. It's not always clear cut. Perhaps these are the patients that could most benefit from CY6463. All of us know that we have the clear cut Alzheimer's patient out here. We have the clear cut vascular dementia patient out here, but there is some overlap mixed dementia. And these are really our target population. And we can actually identify them uh, they have usually have subcortical vascular, small vessel, white matter disease on the MRI, and they have cardiovascular risk factors. And this perhaps could, um, uh, this population also uh, perhaps has pathophysiology, the nitrous oxide dysregulation, endothelial cell loss, impaired uh, cerebral blood flow, vascular leakage, inflammation, and also, there's currently no standard approved therapy to treat vascular dementia or mixed dementia. Our current approved Alzheimer's dementia therapies offer limited benefits. So I'm pleased again to present to you CY6463 study in Hawaii uh, for patients who are older than 65 years old, meet the uh, Alzheimer's NIA criteria for Alzheimer's disease but they must have two or more cardiovascular risk factors, either hypertension, diabetes, cholesterol, or BMI more than 25. And obviously uh, MRI, which we're happy to do them. Uh, if they have not had one to send them to us, we can, uh, MRI must show subcortical small vessel vascular changes. MMSC must be 20 to 26. And uh, this is again, uh, being performed at our Memory Disorder Center Alzheimer's Research Unit. So let's change course a little bit. Um, have you ever heard of the bridge of Ram Ramagen? So uh, not the bridge of uh, not the bridge of Biogen, uh, Ramagen. Uh, Ramagen is a town in uh, Germany. Uh, it is a stronghold in a uh, after World War II, uh, it is a stronghold in German troops and the US and Allied troops uh, find that they could not uh, move into Germany. Uh, this is the Rhine River, it's on the eastern side of Germany uh, because Remagen is such a stronghold, it just prevents any uh, progress the Allied troops could make. So anybody who's in a military strategy knows that if you're going to uh, conquer something, you just take out the supply line. So that's exactly what the Allied troops did. 
they captured the bridge of Ramagen. Uh, and once they captured the bridge of Ramagen, within two weeks, Ramagen and the German troops fell into the hands of the U, uh, US troops and the allies. So why am I telling you this story? Uh, besides the fact that I like to talk story, uh, is that because perhaps is there a certain common pathway? Perhaps we could stop the transport of materials. Perhaps we could look for some common pathway uh, in the uh, pathophysiology of Alzheimer's. Well, some data were presented in 2017 Alzheimer's Parkinson's disease conference. They kind of asked the questions that we've all been thinking about. The beta amyloid, targeting beta amyloid, or just one toxic protein doesn't work. Is it because we, we didn't look at it in the right way? And obviously they listed all the field, uh, 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 gamma secretes, the beta secretes. Uh, our center was actually involved in several of them, uh, including uh, uh, working with Eli Lilly, um, as well as the missions with uh, ASI, with Novartis, beta secretes uh, inhibitor. Uh, none of them just have failed face to face three. And interestingly, even back then, they thought that aducanumab uh, over here may fail. So let's kind of said, let's kind of kind of zoom out a little bit and look for is there some common behavior of the neurotoxic aggregating protein? Why are they aggregating? And perhaps let's just widen it look at other neurodegenerative diseases as well. In Parkinson's, we have the Lewy body. Uh, in Huntington's, we have Huntington inclusions. And in ALS, we have the uh, superoxide dismutase inclusion and prion uh, uh, spongiform, uh, uh, transmitter spongiform encephalopathy. Is there a common behavior to this? There seems to be some inclusions, uh, common behavior to this aggregating proteins. Well, thank goodness, nature always gives us some clue to what's really going on. Thank goodness there's a highly preserved consensus loop in the five prime untranslated region of neurotoxic aggregating proteins. There is more than 50% homology between the five prime untranslated region of the R messenger R uh, or mRNA of alpha synuclein in Parkinson's, APP in Alzheimer's, ELP in prion disease, uh, spongiform encephalopathy, SOD superoxide dysnuclease in ALS patients, talospathy in frontotemporal dementia, uh, and Huntington's disease. There seems to be some homology. That, so what are we after? So the neurotoxic aggregating proteins display some similar features from the gene activation to protein synthesis, to folding, this folding toxic aggregation eventually. The transcription is regulated by copper and zinc. The translation, which is what we're after, is regulated by iron. And I'd like to tell you about another compound that we investigated here in Hawaii called Osifan. Osifan is uh, made, it, made uh, at NIA, manufactured by NIA, and it inhibits the translation of neurotoxic aggregating proteins. And so how does POSIFEN work? POSIFEN works by potentiate the binding of this, uh, this, little, uh, this little molecule here, the IRLP, the iron binding proteins, will potentiate then it will bind to IRLE, iron responsive element. Once they bound, uh, this compound further inhibits the translation of uh, uh, aggregating proteins. No translation no proteins. So we basically take out the bridge. I'm very happy and, um, uh, to present to you uh, this data uh, that was presented two months ago at the June 2021 AAIC, Alzheimer's Association International Conference. Uh, we presented this data with the uh, uh, Novus uh, folks. Um, and this are the data from two phase two clinical trials, uh, mainly in 12 sites in the US. Hawaii is one of the sites where site number 011. Uh, this is double blind placebo controlled trial, biomarker study. 
the endpoints looking for reversal of toxic cascade. Uh, we recruited 14 patients total in the Alzheimer's trial. Four of them are from Hawaii. Uh, 14 patients from the Parkinson trial. Six of them are from Hawaii. We recruit patients with early to moderate Alzheimer's and early to moderate Parkinson's. So what did we find uh, in the cognitive part? Uh, we tested our patients with uh, Welshler Adult Intelligence Skill, which uh, is the gold standard in cognitive assessment. Uh, it claims to measure intellectual performance. So it doesn't really matter what your IQ is, it's just how well you use your intelligence. So the patients that were dosed with uh, Posifen uh, at day number 25, so we dosed them one dose, once a day dosing for 25 days, and at day 25, uh, there seems to be a significant improvement in the Welshler adult intelligence skill compared to uh, at day 25 placebo patients on placebo. Similarly for the Parkinson's patient, uh, at day 25, there seems to be a significant difference. Again, this is a, a very small scale uh, uh, study, uh, show a 6.6 .6 point uh, in Alzheimer's patient, 6.1 point improvement in coding after 25 days of dosings with the Pasifan. Because this is also involved Parkinson's patient, so for the Parkinson's patient, we also tested their uh, speed and coordination. Uh, we do that by testing the UPDRS, uh, Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating. Again, there was a, uh, a difference uh, between uh, the uh, Parkinson's uh, treated group and the placebo group uh, at day 25. So obviously the end point is to measure the lowering of uh, inflammatory markers uh, in uh, predominantly, especially in the Parkinson's disease patients. Uh, the trial measured four inflammatory markers that are prevalent in the brains of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's patients, confirmed C3, YKL40, STRAM2, GFAP, and each of the inflammatory markers shows significant reduction only after 25 days of treatment with Posifen compared to baseline. And we are uh, we're very happy to report uh, that these findings were uh, presented and they were very pleased. Uh, and we will be moving on to a larger scale study. Uh, looking forward to conducting that here at the Hawaii Memory Center and Alzheimer's okay. Research Unit as well. So, so far we talked about um, it's the same thing as the one online, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so far we talk about um, uh, prevent the production, aggregation, but keep in mind that neurons, the brain, is a network. Besides uh, just a cell, beside the neuron, it has synapses, it has dendrites. And we forgot an important part, unlike other organs uh, that may not have dendritic uh, extension and synapses, Neurons works differently, they are network. What about the cells? What about the neuronal death and the, 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 the dying of uh, degeneration of axons and the dendrites and the uh, collapse of the synapses? But what, what can we do? Is there some way, is there other therapies that could potentially uh, look at those or target those? Um, so here's a graph looking at uh, the diagnosis we know that Alzheimer's is a disease that develops even 20 to 30 years started uh, the production of the MLI products and, and tau a little bit later, almost 20 to 30 years. And the green part is high uh, probability of success. And I'd like to tell you about a, a therapy that is almost uh, that we can even apply it to patients uh, with mild to moderate Alzheimer's where even those with some damage for the brain there's always, we, we have always under the assumption that, well, it's too late. Patients with moderate to advanced Alzheimer's, we may not have much to do for them, but let's take a look at it again. Is there something that we can do? I'd like to tell you about a uh, study that we're doing, uh, working with Thera on a compound ATH 1017 uh, that may potentially enhance neuro repair pathway uh, what is ATH 1017? ATH 1017 enhanced HGF MET, which stands for hepatic growth factor and receptor tyroxine kinase. HGF activities 
inhibits the inflammatory cytokine production and promotes anti-inflammatory response in neurons, and it prevents neuronal cell death and promotes repair. Uh, so especially axonal regrowth and do then re regrowth. And ATH17 uh, hope to enhance neuronal network connectivity. Keep in mind the brain, unlike many other organs, is a network in price of connected neurons. So the neurons is connected to the microglia cells, the regular immune systems, is connected to capillaries to support vascular function. Neurons are connected through synapses. So ATH1017 uh, uh, hope to enhance HGF, uh, activates the MET networks in hope working at the synaptic level uh, to support survival and repair of neuronal damage, maintains neuronal function and memory function, and hope to uh, sustain neuronal connections. So the nice thing about um, this study is um, we actually get to play with some tools besides just managing the memory. Uh, and that's really exciting to me. I like playing with tools. Um, we know that um, uh, even within days, uh, you know, at the dosing of uh, this drug, uh, there could be NMDA receptor activation followed by synaptogenesis within hours, anti-inflammatory effects. Even within days, there could be dendritic aberization, meaning and then regrowth. And uh, obviously, weeks or months later, uh, angiogenesis and neurogenesis. And what's really exciting about this is we can potentially measure some of these um, effects through a quantitative, quantitative EEG and P300, which I'll tell you a little bit more about. So the clinical development plan includes uh, obviously measuring cognitive improvement and also measuring neuronal network function, which are translator, translator, translatable tools to guide the dose selection. Mainly two tools that we use. One is the uh, quantitative EEG and the event-related potential uh, ERP P300 latency. P stands for positive, 300 stands for 300 microseconds. So let's look at the ERP first. Uh, so this ERP 300 is measured at the parietal lobe and in healthy individuals, it is positive inflection at the 300 microsecond. However, in Alzheimer's patient, we know that when we measure the EEG, there's not only decrease in amplitude, but we also know that the P300 is delayed sometimes to three to 500 uh, microsecond. So this is, uh, not only a good tool to measure, but it strongly it is also highly correlated of cognitive impairment. What about quantitative EEG? Quantitative EEG is just measuring of EEG frequency. We measure EEG frequency by how many per second delta is slow frequency, four or less. Uh, beta is 12 or more, and gamma is very, very fast activity. We know that uh, besides decrease in the amplitude of EEG signals, in Alzheimer's patients, we also have diminished of the gamma activities as the Alzheimer's progress, the gamma activities are decreases. So this is an exciting study to me because it has measurable neural network connectivity. Uh, as we talk about as the cognitive decline, as Alzheimer's progress, we lose the connectivity uh, or the network of the brain, and we lose the gamma. Uh, there's less and less of gamma frequency or gamma power in quantitative EEG, and our ELP event-related potential P300 latency gets longer and longer. I have to brag a little bit about some of the studies of medical students, and Zay, I believe he's a third year medical student, Celine, who just graduated at the US Hawaii, Nathan, who's a first year medical student, did uh, looking at whether uh, working with Dr. Vimala, uh, Dr. Virag, uh, looking at the EEG of our Alzheimer's patient with FOE4 new uh, that was recently also presented at the AACIC Alzheimer's International Conference uh, in June. Congratulations to NZ, Celine, and Nathan. For the, and Dr. Vimala for the excellent work that you do. We're very happy to make this study available to Hawaii, uh, Hira, 
what we call the LIFT AD study. Uh, this is also another NIH funded study, phase 2A. The study patients will be dosed with ATH 1070 for six months. This is followed later by six months of open label, so a year of treatment. We're looking for patients 55 to 85 years old, mild to moderate. Again, this is, this is great because our patients with moderate dementia, even as low as MMSC 14, may have an option. A lot of times we have very little options for them. So this is exciting for me. So at this point, uh, I'd like to uh, have one of our medical students, Connor Gu, second year medical student. Uh, Connor, if you can unmute yourself uh, to present uh, uh, our findings, uh, polling uh, some of our Alzheimer's patients. Uh, under Connor, work under Dr. Pat Borman, our geriatrician, uh, to poll some of our patients. Uh, and th he's done this under the Brain Research Innovation Translation Lab research for our medical students. So Connor, uh, take it away, unmute yourself. Hi everyone, my name is Connor Gu and I'm a second year medical student at JAPSOM. And I'll just be quickly presenting a current ongoing research project here at Hawaii Pacific Neuroscience, which is looking at caregivers of Alzheimer patients and their knowledge and hesitancy regarding Edgehome. Um, so we first found all the Alzheimer's patients seen at HPN during the past two and a half years or so and excluded the patients who are now deceased. And we then called the 352 remaining patients and caregivers. We got the caregiver on the other end of the line and administered a five to 10 minute phone survey to the caregivers of these Alzheimer's patients. And overall, we were able to get a response from 86 total caregivers. Um, out of these 86, we had 54 caregivers or about 63% who were unfamiliar with the drug Adjuhelm and 32 caregivers or 37% uh, who were familiar with Azure Home. And so some of the questions we had and aspects we aimed to get a better understanding of regarding caregivers of Alzheimer's patients were identifying factors, making them hesitant of Azure Home and some of the demographics of this population. Um, so now moving on to some of the preliminary results. Uh, we asked all survey respondents um, questions regarding their demographics, but reserve the adjuhelm specific ones for only those familiar with the drug. So again, there were uh, 32 um, caregivers who were familiar with the drug. And in total, the survey comprised of about 25 questions. Um, so in the upper left-hand corner, we first see that only about 15.6% of caregivers familiar with adjuhelm believe it to be safe. Um, while 31.3% believed it to not be safe and a majority or 53.1% declined to answer. Um, now, the reason so many declined to answer was largely due to caregivers being sort of unsure and not feeling well informed enough to make a firm decision uh, regarding the drug safety. In the upper right hand corner, we can see caregiver readiness to have their loved one receive Adrenal if given the opportunity to do so. And so while the majority of caregivers were against having these HPN Alzheimer's patients receive Adjuhelm, about 28% were moderately ready or very ready to have them receive the drug if given the opportunity, which I thought, I thought was pretty interesting um, since in the upper left-hand corner, only about 15.6% believed it to be safe. And then um, lastly at the bottom, um, this question asked which of the following factors regarding Adjuhelm uh, is the caregiver's top concern. So we gave them a list of those factors and asked them to pick their top concern. And so clearly the top one was safety regarding um, the drug side effects, followed by those who declined to answer. And then next up were factors associated with the expedition of the drug's approval and the finances associated with it since the drug is quite costly. And so these were just a few of the preliminary results we collected. Um, we just finished our phone survey about one week ago. So there's still a lot more data to go through and analyze. And it should be pretty interesting to see what we come up with and what we find. So uh, thank you all for listening to me and back to you, Dr. Liao. Thank you. Good job, Connor and your team. And uh, thank you to your wonderful team and Dr. Borman for guiding you guys through collecting this uh, important data.
Um, you are indeed a shining medical student. So in conclusion, um, we are excited uh, indeed uh, that in June 2021, FDA uh, granted an accelerated approval of aducanumab for MCI and mouse Alzheimer's patient. But we must not lose sight of the big picture. At this time, we do not yet know for sure whether amyloid reduction constitute a suitable surrogate for clinical benefit. Although we know about the safety data from ARIA from the clinical trials, the edema, we, it's great that it's reversible, it's asymptomatic, only in high dose, but we don't really know what the real world data is once it's approved out there, that is still unknown. And obviously we don't know what it will, how it will impact costs uh, on healthcare expenditure, uh, $56,000 a year. And we know that from our survey, majority of Hawaii patients and a caregiver's poll are not quite ready. Um, what do we do? Um, our feelings uh, and my personal feelings are that we advocate for the research. You know, I'm an advocate for research. I believe that we need to continue to collect the data. We certainly are open to uh, potentially working with them, but more, more important than even offering the treatment is to make sure that the data is solid, the data is collected, especially the safety real world data. Uh, and also the clinical efficacy data needs to be solidified. And uh, right now, uh, Biogen has up to nine years to complete that and hope to work with them. Uh, but the one exciting thing for me is we get to explore other mechanistic pathway. There's a, re a renewed interest to do that, either alone or combination amyloid-based therapies. So here it is, the importance of perspective. So it's a tau, no, it's a basque, oxidative stress. How do you like my picture? So keeping in mind the big picture, importance of perspective, so important when we do research, when we do studies and how we apply it to clinical care and apply it to our patients uh, again, just to summarize the memory disorder research in Hawaii, for patients with MCI, mild to moderate dementia, we have the T3D, the glucose metabolism, Thera, Live AD uh, study. Um, and for patients with preclinical to MCI, we have the Nova Nodus Evoke study, which is another anti diabetic drug. I don't have time to talk about that because it's preclinical, a spinal tap will be needed. For the other two study MCI, T3D and Athera, no, no spinal tap is needed. For patients that may have kind of a vascular picture, mixed dementia, Alzheimer's, we have the Cyclaren uh, mixed dementia, Alzheimer's disease with vascular pathology study. We even have a study for Alzheimer's disease patient agitation. Uh, please call us at Research Hotline or email me or go to our website. I'd like to finish off uh, by first thanking Dr. Masaki uh, for your commitment uh, to our community and uh, the, uh, the Alzheimer's community. I'd like to thank the Alzheimer's Association and the people for working hard and I'd like to thank all of our partners and sponsors. But we really cannot do this without our wonderful faculty, our re wonderful clinical research faculty, Dr. Birek, Dr. Neurologist Bimala Karzana, uh, Dr. Yalsi and geriatrician Dr. Pat Borman, Dr. Chang Yamamoto Srihasha and all of our wonderful research students that work at the Brain Research Innovation uh, Labs, uh, the students that work on the EduHem project, uh, Connor, Samantha, Savia, Jaron, Kaysen, and the students work on the EG project, Celine and Zay Nathan, and mahalo to our patients and precious families whom we get to humbly serve and learn from every day. Thank you so much. Dr. Liao, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. We already have uh, one question, which Dr. Yamada is asking, and I think it reflects a question from all of us. He's asking, do you plan to use the treatment yourself, the aducanumab, from the package insert, just examining the results for MMSE, the mean baseline MMSE is 26.3 in the high dose group, 26.4 in the placebo group, which is a pretty high scoring mild cognitive impairment group. It would seem difficult to identify such MCI patients in primary care 
without extensive evaluation. The change from baseline at week 78 was minus 2.7 in the high dose group, minus 3.3 in the placebo group. This would seem to me a clinically insignificant difference. It doesn't seem to be worth the cost, uh, as well as the risk of brain edema or microhemorrhages in 41% of patients. So would you mind commenting on that, Dr. Liao? Yes, absolutely. Uh, no, I think Dr. Uh, uh, Seiji Imada uh, has, has a great point. Uh, I totally uh, agree with him, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, let me see if I could go back to the slide. You know, uh, I totally agree with you. Uh, the clinical efficacy data, there's still some questions to be sorted out. Although there is a significant amyloid reduction in the PET, we do not yet know for sure whether reduction in PET which is what the FDA approval, accelerated approval is really based on, uh, translates to real world clinical benefits. Um, and obviously the real world safety data on area is unknown. Um, uh, you know, obviously, you know, uh, my, my personal uh, preference uh, is that I, I always like my patients to have choice. So, um, you know, I, I would not, uh, I would let them know I have this other studies that is oral pill once a day, uh, you know, that do not have, I uh, do not have to monitor you with the MRI brain, uh, look for edema and hemorrhage, you know, uh, but I also have uh, something that's FDA approved where we're going to have to do this. Uh, that's costly, $56,000 a year. Um, you know, I think our job is to uh, mainly uh, um, uh, educate, uh, obviously, um, you know, uh, I'm not opposed to offering them in our community, uh, but I also know that, um, you know, uh, Biogen is working with other entities uh, to offer it at other centers, uh, which uh, we, 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 we are, we're glad for as well. Uh, but the most important thing to me is that we need to continue to monitor the data uh, to confirm the clinical efficacy one way or another and to uh, monitor the real world safety data on the rear. Hopefully, does that answer your question, Dr. Yamada? I think uh, many of us, Dr. Liao, are kind of concerned about how this FDA process went through. Uh, I mean, I think it's a very unusual FDA approval process, to say the least, uh, you know, with no no uh, solid endpoint data. You know, they've used surrogate outcomes sort of as their justification for, for approval. And so I know this is a big controversy in the literature because I'm seeing things in the newsletters constantly. So I think all of us are kind of concerned about that. No, absolutely. I think the concerns are, are, are totally uh, are valid. Uh, if anything, uh, I believe you, you, you saw the recent article that came out in the New England Journal as well. Uh, about the uh, uh, about the significant um, concern brought up uh, by the FDA panel themselves, um, so I think the concerns are, are, are valid, um, you know, and and I think the the the, uh, the unfortunate thing uh, to me as a researcher is now that it's approved, uh, it would be a lot more difficult to monitor the data. Uh, to know what the real, uh, to know what the real incidence is, to know what the clinical efficacy is, because now that's going to be out there, you know, um, I certainly hope that um, you know Biogen will be committed to uh, uh, continue to monitor this, uh, which I'm sure uh, they would. Um, but certainly, um, uh, the concern about the FDA approval uh, is certainly valid. Thank you, Dr. Liao. Uh, does anyone in the audience have any other questions? Michaela, could you put the evaluation link in the chat box, please? Oh, here it is. So for CME purposes, everyone, please follow the link in the chat box or through our other venues uh, to do the evaluation to get your CME. Uh, we have about a couple of minutes left. If anyone has any more questions, please type them in the chat box right away. In the meantime, I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Liao and his entire team, not just for this presentation, Dr. Liao, but for all you do for the community in Hawaii. 
Without you, we would not have access to many of these clinical trials for our patients. So we really appreciate all that you and your staff do. There's a question about the recording and the slides. Yes, the recording will be posted on our website. So if you know of people who were unable to attend today's session, they can certainly go to the website to watch it later on. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Liao. It doesn't look like we have any more questions. We really appreciate you sharing your expertise. My pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Masaki.